Hi, thank you for coming today, uh, Sylvia and Akil, and taking time out of your day um, to talk to us about sickle cell. I want to talk specifically about uh, when Akil has come in uh, with a chest crisis and how that's been for you guys as a family. So, Akil, what does it feel like when you have a chest crisis? Can you describe it in a couple of words? It was very painful. Right. And how does it feel when you then know that you're going to have to come into hospital with that, Sylvia? So, yeah, maybe you could... Tell us a bit about it. My experience with him with chest um, pain, I um, he struggles to breathe. Right. And um, um, he has in, an intense pain in the chest. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when um, most times he tells me that, Mom, I can't breathe properly and we right. need to go to the hospital. That must be really scary for you guys. It is. It is indeed very scary. What does it feel like when you come onto the ward? What do the doctors and nurses do to to help you? With my experience with him, um, the first thing that they did is they put him on oxygen mm -hmm. um, just for um, him to, to manage his breathing. Mm -hmm. And then they put him on pain relief. Yeah. And at that point in time, um, they start seeing what kind of pain relief works for him at that point in time, um, if he needs to be top top. But most of the time, he's on oxygen mm -hmm. so That's to help with his breathing. Yeah. And what about for you, Akil, when you come onto the wards and you see, you know, all the other nurses and doctors, what are the one or two things they do that really put your mind at ease? Mm, Painkiller. Painkillers, yeah. Akil, do you get scared at all uh, when you get admitted to the wards? Mm. No? Why do you think that is? Mm, just used to it. You're used to it. Right, okay. What about for you, Mum? Every time you see a child going to hospital as a parent, you do worry. And most times I don't worry. And, um, but I know that most of the time he's in great hands and the doctors are there to take care of him and to make sure he's, um, he's comfortable and to ease up the pain for him. Yeah. And um, most times when, when he comes in, he's, he gets blood transfusion, right. which helps yeah. with his... Um, blood hemoglobin mm -hmm. and um, with antibiotics. So yeah. those two combination does relieve the pain for him. So it sounds like a combination of things really do help when you get to the ward. Yeah. So Leah, is there anything else that worries you when you come into hospital? Every time that he has chest crisis, it does have um, a sky in his lungs. That in itself is very scary for me as a parent to sort of like hear that. So from then, obviously I try to help him manage um, manage himself um, as a sickle cell patient mm -hmm. by making sure he's dressed properly, making sure he's eating course, properly, yeah. and making sure he's taking his medication. Yeah. Do you get other input as well when you're on the wards, things like from other therapies, physios? He, yes. Um, he has to do chest exercise. That helps with his coughing. And then they tell him that he needs to cough so that any phlegm that is clogged up in his chest can come in and clear his airways. Yes, yeah, so the incentive barometer helps you to take in really deep breaths so that you get oxygen right to the base of your lungs. And then any infection or any gunk that might be brewing there just gets the opportunity, like you said, to be coughed out. And with a combination of blood transfusion, antibiotics, it's about tackling and getting in there fast. Because yeah. it's, it's one of the main concerns for us is when patients do come in with acute chest crisis is that you know we need to get on top of that painful episode very quickly because otherwise deterioration, you know, our worry is that you're going to end up in intensive care unit if the chest infection or crisis is not managed quick enough. So it's great to hear that you've had that input um, on the wards and it's been a quick turnaround for Akil. If there was one or two things you could tell medical staff, professionals out there, what would that be? Basically to listen to the parent and to listen to the patient. And um, because they can, them alone can tell you what, pain that they're in for them, yeah. for you, for the medical practitioner to be able to give them a proper care. That's it. You guys definitely are the expert in, in managing pain and things at home. It's, it's difficult to try and comprehend that. And I understand that when you come in and you see different faces. Well, actually, this is what you do day in, day out, year after year. And, you know, it's so important that you're listened to and you guys know the tricks and tips that work as well for managing pain. So I think it's really important that that is that is um, adhered to when you guys do come in. So thank you. Today we're going to talk about acute chest crisis in children and young people. And so Sarah, 
Um, how do you approach the child who presents with chest crisis? So some of the typical symptoms that a child with acute chest syndrome can present with are wheezing or breathlessness. Uh, they can present with chest pain of varying severity. And sometimes they can also present with cough, which can be productive or non-productive, along with fever. Um, it's important to remember that sometimes, especially children of the younger age group, can present with atypical symptoms, which makes it harder to diagnose this condition in them. Um, and the best way to approach these children is to follow an A to E approach, ensuring that their oxygen saturations are above 95% in room air. So Mike, what early interventions are important um, to start in these children when they present with chest crisis? So uh, I, think, I think it's like Sarah says, A to E, so their airway. Breathing is their oxygen. C is their fluids, but judiciously given. You need to assess their level of consciousness treat their temperatures and their pain and give antibiotics. And then they'll need some blood tests done when you're putting in their cannula. And that might include a blood culture and certainly include, include inflammatory markers. Um, and you may even want a blood gas. Remember incentive spirometry mm. early as well, as well as oxygen starting off early for them. Yeah. So, Temi, how do we identify a child who is deteriorating? So, it's important to monitor them, be very vigilant with them. You want to keep an eye on their oxygen saturation. So, it's important to make sure that it's high and it's measured in room air because we get falsely reassured when it's high despite them being in oxygen. Again, increasing oxygen requirements despite them being in oxygen should alert you. Decreasing consciousness and um, worsening tachycardia and tachypnea. If their um, HB is dropping, their white cell counts are going or platelets are dropping. Um, also, a worsening consciousness, be alert for this could be actually a neurological complication. So really important to keep an eye on all those um, signs and symptoms I mentioned. And Mike, what are the measures that we can instigate if they are deteriorating? Mm. So I suppose it's a, we need a high dependency unit assessment quite promptly and early. We need to assess their fluids um, so have we underfilled them or overfilled them? And are we managing their pain appropriately? They may need re-imaging of their chest, check they're on the right antibiotics. And they may need a simple blood transfusion. And I suppose rarely, um, some of them need mechanical ventilation. So summarizing it all, it's important to assess them as you would for any acutely unwell child, A to E approach, early interventions like incentive spirometry, oxygen, really important. Remember not to overhydrate them. Inform HDU very early on and think about things like um, top-up transfusion, X-ray transfusion, informing our colleagues, the hematologists, really early and HDU. Thank you so much, Temi, for summarising. Thank you, Sarah and Temi, for coming today. So we've heard about chest crisis today. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to add? Yes, I think it's important to remember that um, a proportion of children may present with a painful episode, which then during that episode progresses onto a chest crisis. So it's important to have a fairly low threshold in expecting that things may escalate to the chest, particularly in view of sort of keeping an eye on the oxygen saturations low threshold for a chest um, x-ray if there is any dip in the oxygen saturations, particularly bearing in mind if there is pain in the rib cage, pain in the abdomen, to really initiate incentive spirometry or appropriate chest physio, uh, really to stop the chest um, crisis from progressing. What do you think about blood transfusions? So yes, I think it's very important not to forget the importance of early top-up transfusions in this context, particularly if there is room to top up, you know. So if you're seeing that the child is progressing onto a chest syndrome, you know, and you are able to, then I think early intervention with the top up transfusion it often really is very helpful in stopping the patient from progressing into a very severe crisis, which may require additional me mechanical ventilation and so on. And the other thing to not forget is to make sure that you don't overhydrate or hyperhydrate the child so that you end up with sort of circulatory overload and that might tip the patient into sort of respiratory failure. So that is very important not to overdo. So if the child is drinking, please allow them to drink um, and not give intravenous fluids. That's brilliant. Thank you. That's really useful information. Thank you for taking the time today.